During the following program, look for our web markers, which lead you to more information at our website. Next, he was a decorated fighter pilot in two wars. America's first astronaut to orbit the Earth. Oh, that view is tremendous. A United States Senator. And now is about to become the oldest person ever to fly in space. Take a journey back in time. Godspeed, John Glenn. And into the future. With John Glenn, American hero. Funding for John Glenn, American Hero, is provided by the annual financial support of PBS viewers like you. Major funding has been provided by the following corporation. I got to see a man walk on the moon. My kids deserve to see something as inspiring. NASA and its worldwide partners will soon launch the first stages of the International Space Station. At Kennedy Space Center in Florida, the Space Shuttle Discovery is being readied for launch. This mission, which NASA calls STS-95, is packed with scientific experiments. The international crew of seven includes astronauts from Japan and Spain. On to one, two. <laughs> No one is a household name, except John Glenn. His presence has generated intense public interest and rekindled nostalgia about the early days of the space race. Uh, this is Friendship 7. Uh, the sky above is completely black. I can see stars though up above. I do not have any of the constellations identified as yet, over. At the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., visitors are pausing longer to inspect Glenn's Mercury spacecraft, Friendship 7. Nearly everyone old enough to remember has a story to tell about the day John Glenn first flew. I remember that we needed a hero at that time, and he was it. I know that a couple of people had gone up in space before, but the fact that somebody would actually go around the Earth seemed especially exciting. You always wondered if he was going to make it back, uh, what was going on up there. Uh, you know, you just, every news report, watching it all day. Now, I've always had a little bit of claustrophobia, and I thought I could never crawl in something that size and go that far into the dark. I, I admired him to do it. Of the seven original Mercury astronauts, three are now gone. Gus Grissom lost his life in an Apollo launch pad fire in 1967. A brain tumor took Deke Slayton's life in 1993. Alan Shepard died of complications from leukemia in 1998. John Glenn was the oldest of the Mercury astronauts. Now, 77, he is about to become the oldest human ever to go into space. I've had a lot of satisfaction out of my, my whole life of doing something, not just doing a new, but doing things that I felt benefited other people. And uh, now at this point, going back up again or having the opportunity to benefit a lot of other people, I get a great deal of satisfaction out of that. <laughs> this is <the> easy. <laughs> What has made John Glenn so driven? What is it about him that appeals to so many? 
Will this second flight be a sentimental voyage celebrating Glenn's heroics of the past? Or the next step towards space in the 21st century? John Herschel Glenn, Jr. was born on July 18, 1921, in the hills of Ohio. At the time of Glenn's birth, this region abounded in two things, coal and Scots-Irish immigrants. Here, patriotism was taught as a virtue. Family mattered. And above all, a Calvinist faith in God reigned. Glenn's parents were devout Presbyterians who instilled in their only son the belief that every person was part of a divine plan. Ambition, John was taught, could go hand in hand with God's glory. The importance of faith blended with the experience of growing up in the small town of New Concord, Ohio. I guess it was the feeling of patriotism and of responsibility to the country that I picked up as a, as a kid in New Concord, and I guess that's been a, a rather guiding star in my whole life. New Concord also gave John his best friend and his future wife, Annie Castor. I've never known a time I did not know Annie. Our parents were good friends and visited back and forth, and Annie and I literally uh, were in playpen together. After high school, they enrolled at the local college and began talking of marriage. Annie was a music major. John wanted to be a doctor. But a Sunday in December 1941 changed those plans. I was driving up to the chapel that afternoon, a Sunday afternoon, to uh, hear Annie's organ recital. And I heard news on the car radio, so I stopped and, and uh, listened to the broadcast. And I didn't tell Annie about that until after the, uh, her recital was over, but what I had heard on that Sunday afternoon was Pearl Harbor had been bombed. That was December 7th. And uh, she and I had planned to be married after we were out of college, but uh, we sat and talked that evening and decided my responsibility was to go, and I dropped out of school. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, Glenn signed up to become a pilot. In training, he made two close friends. One was Monty Goodman from Pennsylvania. The other was a tall Texan named Tom Miller. They all excelled as pilots. We got singled out in the squadron because we were so highly motivated to be the best in the squadron. John was what we considered a time hog. Uh, that terminology is used for a person who's uh, interested in flying at all costs. In other words, on his day off, he would go out and fly. Glenn now had two loves in his life, flying and Annie Castor. At the end of flight training, Glenn married his childhood sweetheart. A year later, Glenn, Goodman, and Miller flew their first combat mission over the Marshall Islands. On the very, very first flight we went on, uh, we were all dead set on making a good attack, of course. And it was a ground attack, came in on a uh, glide bombing run with the Corsairs dropping bombs. And standard procedure was as you came in and made your bomb drop, then you pulled off the island and went out so many miles on a certain bearing, and then you started circling for a rendezvous of all planes 
and money didn't show up at the rendezvous. War making became very, very personal after that point. He came back from that mission and wept unashamedly. At the same time, Glenn said, uh, not only about Goodman's death, but about other deaths that he, of course, uh, encountered during his long military career, that after a while, you don't get hardened to it, but you do realize that you can't change fate, and that it is your duty, if you want to remain sane, to move on. And ultimately, that's what Glenn did. Over the course of two wars, Glenn flew 149 combat missions and was highly decorated. He continued his ascent up the aviation ranks in peacetime as a test pilot. By now, he was not only a husband, but a father of two children. In 1957, he found himself assigned to an office job. But what Glenn really wanted to do was fly. He was bound to a desk at the time, and he was saying, I'm going nowhere fast here. And he was looking for ways to kind of get himself in the eye of his superiors uh, to move on to something more interesting. Glenn sold to the Pentagon the idea of a publicity stunt, Project Bullet, a supersonic flight across the continental United States, which set a new speed record. He gets out of the plane, and immediately he becomes a, a rather famous individual. He was just a press agent's dream as far as quotes and things like that. He had that perfect combination of kind of, uh, you know, youthful charm and a good old country boy kind of uh, aw shucks nature about him, and yet combined with a very highly uh, honed and, and finely tuned uh, technical skill. Save that tune! Soon afterwards, he was invited to appear in two national TV game shows. I've got a secret, and name that tune. Name this tune. Do you know the name of that song? The Chicken Reel. The Chicken Reel. You are right. They always team people up on that program. Nettie Hodges uh, later was the juvenile lead in the original cast of Music Man. He was my partner on that. He was a 10-year-old boy. We'd like to make you an honor again, Father, if you'd like to be. Well, that'd be fine. I'd be very honored. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now, if you'd raise your right hand, I'll uh, administer you. All right, fine. Excuse me, sir. Right two fingers. Only two, two fingers. fingers. All right, fine. If you ask me. All right. I'm Major John Glenn, Jr. I'm Major John Glenn, Jr. Promise to do my best. Promise to do my best. To do my duty. To do my duty. To God in my country. To God in my country. To be square. To be square. And obey the law of the pack. And obey the law of the pack. Here's your pen. Uh, you find a spot there to pin it on? <laughs> <laughs> there must be some room there somewhere. <laughs> the year was 1957. The same year Russia shocked the United States by launching into space a satellite called Sputnik. Uh, what do you think of the Russian satellite, which is circling the Earth at 18,000 miles <laughs> per hour? Well, to say the least, George, they're out of this world, but... <laughs> uh, this is uh, really quite an advancement for not only the Russians, but for international science. I think we'd all agree on that. It's the first time anybody has ever been able to get anything out that far in space and keep it there for any length of time. And this is probably the first step toward space travel or moon travel, something we'll probably run into maybe in Eddie's lifetime here at least. <laughs> Eddie, would you like to take a trip to the moon? No, sir, I like it fine right here. <laughs> the space race was on. Now the question was, who would be first to put a human in space? On April 9th, 1959, NASA presented seven men who were willing to go where no one had gone before. Take pictures now. 
At first glance, they all seemed similar, but Glenn quickly began to stand out. I'm uh, a Presbyterian, Protestant Presbyterian, and uh, take my religion very seriously, as a matter of fact. We're placed here with certain talents and capabilities. It's up to each one of us to use those talents and capabilities as best he can. It was exactly what people wanted to hear. It's as if Glenn's performance kind of washed over the other astronauts as well. You could almost see the sidelong glances that he was getting from his colleagues there, but it became pretty obvious as the press conference wore on that the questions were more and more being directed toward Glenn. Uh, some of the guys were mumbling about, you know, John's PR ability. And as I remember, we were given uh, each a chance and we took turns answering, and John did better. I got on this project because it'd probably be the nearest to heaven I'd ever get, and I wanted to make the most of it. My feelings are that John this has great charisma, and he's had, at that time, he had had a lot more experience with the press than anybody else in the group. And it showed, I think. What all seven men shared in common was their test pilot background and their competitive drive. We were all very highly motivated. We all had been the test pilots. Each one of us thought we deserved to be number one in whatever was going to happen. Even a recreation day spent water skiing was a chance to see who was the best. There was another tension among the seven. Celebrity status had led to skirt chasing by some of the astronauts, which came close to being exposed as a national scandal. Glenn helped convince a reporter not to publish the story then let his fellow astronauts know that their behavior had to change. This is a bunch of pilots. They get together and drink and carouse and generally behave in a manner that is viewed by Presbyterians as unbecoming. And uh, that's the way John felt about it. And he let everybody know. He stood up for what he thought was right. And that's one of the things that I admire about him. Glenn's stance further distanced him from most of the others. Then, NASA officials, trying to determine who would fly first, asked the astronauts their own opinion in a secret ballot. It was one popularity contest Glenn did not win. When Alan Shepard was eventually selected to fly first, Glenn was crushed. But Alan Shepard would have his own disappointment. On April 12, 1961, the Soviets launched Yuri Gagarin into orbit. The first human to venture into space was neither Glenn nor Shepard, but a Russian. Glenn now set his hopes on being the second American to fly. That assignment went elsewhere, too, to Gus Grissom. When Grissom was selected as number two, uh, it really devastated him. I think he had a feeling that he had failed, and it was kind of embarrassing to him to be out among people. And uh, one day, we had a little conversation out here in the yard, and I said some rather harsh words to him about uh, the fact that he was running his family into the ground by not taking him out, and just because he was hurt because he didn't get the first day. And I said to him at that time, I don't know what you're so upset about to shoot the count of the flight that's going to count as the guy that goes around the world instead of just being pooped up and fall back. It was Glenn's good fortune to be chosen for America's first attempt to orbit the Earth. This was a longer and far more dangerous mission. 
and Glenn would be riding a more powerful rocket, the Atlas, an intercontinental missile originally designed to carry a nuclear warhead. It was a rocket with a history of spectacular problems. In the early hours of February 20th, 1962, Glenn readied for his launch into space. Although the flight had been scrubbed 10 times before, people still lined the beaches. Millions more were watching at home on their television sets. Right before his space flight, uh, he had a very frank discussion with his family about the prospect that he might die. And he was very concerned that his children not blame anybody, not blame God if he were to die. The idea was that he was doing what he loved. He was doing something important for them, for their country. And he really felt that if that were to happen, it is the hand of fate. Nothing could be done about that. Mercury capsule, go. All pre-start battle lights are correct. The ready light is on. Eject Mercury umbilical. Oily Rider scope is retracting. Range operation, go. clear to launch. The light is out. 19 seconds Godspeed, John Glenn. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Ignition. 3, 2, 1, 0. Left off. Left off. You could just hear the enthusiasm in his voice when Glenn is at his absolute finest and at his happiest when he is uh, involved in flying or talking about flying. So this was the best of both worlds because not only is he up there in the heavens, uh, he's telling the world about it as well. Uh, the sunset was beautiful. It went down very rapidly. I still have a brilliant blue band uh, clear across the horizon, almost covering my whole window. But Glenn soon had no time to sightsee. Near the end of the first orbit, one of Friendship 7's automatic thrusters began malfunctioning. Then a second one failed. Next, his gyroscope went out. And on the ground, mission controllers had an even bigger worry. We are recommending that you leave the retro package on to the entire reentry. Do you read? Uh, this is Friendship 7. Now, what is the reason for this? Do you have any reason? Over. Not at this time. <laughs> A signal from the spacecraft was warning that Friendship 7's heat shield might be loose. If that were true, Glenn had no way of surviving re-entry. He and his spacecraft would burn up in the atmosphere. As Friendship 7 began re-entry, flames enveloped the spacecraft. Glenn heard metallic scraping sounds and then ominous thumps. Next, large burning chunks of what Glenn feared was his heat shield began flying past his window. This Friendship 7, a real fireball outside. But gradually, the fire outside subsided. The heat shield had held. Right here, steelhead. Uh, Friendship 7, the shoot looks very good. Over. 
It was almost like it was designed by Hollywood. It wasn't, but all the suspense you ever could have, and then I had some problems in flight, and will he make it, won't he make it? Well, it was just so dramatic. After Glenn was retrieved from the ocean, he was whisked away for a medical exam to see what effects space might have had on his body. Three days later, Air Force One landed at Cape Canaveral. President Kennedy had come to pay homage on behalf of a grateful nation. solid with people and most of it were school children waving u.s flags i don't know anybody in nasa that did any kind of planning for that kind of a reception it was just an emotional outpouring of what this space flight had done for the morale of the country the celebrations which included a giant Friendship 7 cake, were just the beginning. Glenn and his family flew back with the president to a rainy Washington. A White House reception was followed by a parade up Pennsylvania Avenue, where a crowd of a quarter of a million people stood in the rain to catch a glimpse of America's newest hero. We could hardly believe uh, when we came back, you know, the uh, excitement and both here in Washington and ticker tape parade in New York. It was a, something thrilling to see for this country, for people to feel that way. Two days later, the scene was repeated in Glenn's hometown of New Concord, where the normal population of 2,300 swelled to 75,000. The parade ended with an appearance at Glenn's hometown college, where the astronaut, with his proud parents seated on stage, held an impromptu press conference. I'd like to know whether you'd back up your dad on this. When we were here the last time, he was asked whether or not uh, you would I go to the... I disclaim any credit for anything my dad said at that press Caught up in the celebrations, Glenn had no way of knowing that his career as an astronaut was already over. Says, quote, John H. Glenn is a born astronaut whose physique could enable him to withstand the pressures of space flight until the age of 55. How do you feel about that, sir? President Kennedy understood that John Glenn's enormous popularity could be turned to political advantage. But how? In September 1962, Kennedy paid a visit to Houston, Texas, where NASA had opened its new center for manned space activities. The Mercury astronauts were already in Houston by the time of Kennedy's trip. They had been treated to a Texas-style welcome, complete with Stetson hats. Kennedy had come for a first-hand inspection of the progress being made toward putting a man on the moon. By this time, Kennedy and his brother Bobby were mapping out a new career for Glenn. 
His next destination, the Kennedys had decided, would not be the moon, but the U.S. Senate. Glenn figured that, well, the, the skids are greased. You know, basically, as far as he was concerned, here's a win-win proposition. I'm a hero astronaut. Well, I'm not going to go up in space again. I do and have always had an ambition for further public service, and politics certainly is part of that. And if I'm traveling on the dime of the uh, president and his attorney general brother, what could be bad? Well, of course, we all know what happened. That in 1963, the president was assassinated, and suddenly all political bets were off. Glenn was chosen to represent the astronauts at the funeral. There was a line went clear out across the East Plaza here, and Annie and I were there, and uh, we came up, and his body was lying in state in the rotunda, and it was a very moving experience. Distraught over Kennedy's death, he sought comfort the night before the burial at a memorial to another fallen president. The Lincoln Memorial at night, if you haven't been there, is almost like going to church, I think. It's almost a religious experience. The quotes of Lincoln that they have on the wall in there from his different speeches. You look down the mall and and all the symbolism of what this country is all about that is there, and at night it usually is quiet. I sat back sort of and thought about this and thought about my responsibilities to the country and what I could do. The purpose of this meeting then is to declare myself a candidate for the Democratic nomination for United States Senator from the state of Ohio. But Glenn's run for office was short-lived. Only five weeks into the campaign, Glenn slipped and fell in a freak accident. He was diagnosed as suffering from traumatic vertigo. Immediately, Glenn found that uh, when he was in the hospital that he could barely even breathe without becoming incredibly nauseous, never mind move his head. Uh, and uh, the doctors said to him, there's very little we can do except wait to see whether or not this gets better. We should tell you that in 25 to 30 percent of the cases, there is residual permanent damage. Unable to walk, let alone campaign, Glenn, from his hospital bed, withdrew from the race. I've delayed this decision as long as possible. In fact, too long for many of the people that have worked on it, in the hopes that my recovery might accelerate. But this has not happened. Some of uh, his uh, supporters um, who thought that perhaps he was looking for an easy way out uh, were uh, very critical of him for pulling out so quickly. These people, however, didn't know John Glenn because it, this was something that even today he talks about with gritted teeth. Uh, he hated the idea that he would have to quit. By 1968, Glenn was back on the campaign trail. Not for himself, but for Robert Kennedy's presidential bid. Glenn was a prominent presence for Bobby. Bobby needed him, he needed Bobby. But they also, there was a deep affection between the two men. Glenn was with Bobby Kennedy when he died, and it fell to John Glenn to inform the Kennedy children that their father was dead. It is something that you wouldn't wish on anybody else, and yet, if you had to have somebody do it, Glenn is probably one of the few people who could handle it with the kind of sensitivity that would be required. As painful as Robert Kennedy's death had been, the experience on the campaign trail stirred anew Glenn's own passions for public office. It took two more attempts, but in 1974, Glenn was elected to the United States Senate. He has been there ever since. The most popular senator in Ohio's history. He also made a run for the White House in 1984. Yet compared to his glory days as an astronaut, Glenn's political star has not shined as brightly. 
I think personally that it was always difficult for John to be a good politician because I think there are some areas that he just would not negotiate on. In my view, that's a great trait for a politician. I'm not so sure that's very good. Mr. Chairman. Above all, Glenn prides himself on his integrity. But he came under attack in 1990 when he and four other senators were implicated on charges of using improper influence on behalf of failed savings and loan businessman Charles Keating. We've already spent a year investigating this matter. And each of you has come to know all there is to know about my conduct. As and I was very bitter at that time because it was so unfair. It was a very expensive thing for the lawyer's bills and everything it was the low point, I guess, in my life because my ethics and my morality and my uh, what I thought was right and wrong were being challenged. I acted honorably, I behaved honestly, and I have neither tainted my own reputation nor tarnished the reputation of this body. The investigation's so final report slapped Glenn's hand for using reason, bad judgment in arranging a luncheon between Keating and Speaker of the House Jim Wright. Yet the report concluded senators, Glenn had done nothing wrong. Five in the room. That was a low point, one of the low, very low points in my life. That year and a half, we came out of it okay, and I was reelected, and so that's it. I think now is good from some historic perspective. Seven years and, uh, later, have, in 1997, uh, Glenn announced his retirement from public office. The reason for retiring, he said, was Senate. his age. Uh, it wasn't that I was afraid of another run. It was, as I said, at that particular time, there is just no cure for the common birthday. <laughs> Thinking of history still to be written, Glenn has donated his papers and mementos to Ohio State University. They include his father's World War I helmet, his Friendship 7 joystick, and an old Stetson shaped to Texan standards by Lyndon Johnson. And he finished it off by saying, and you'd never get by in Texas unless you got a little dimple in it right here. John Glenn may have been retiring, but he had already set in motion a plan that would exploit his age and send him on his next adventure. Glenn has watched the shuttle program from a distance and dreamt of flying again. When someone who has risked their life countless times for our space program and for our country comes to you and asks, I'm willing to take the risk of space flight and serve my country again, because I think we could do more to benefit the lives of older Americans, can I go? If that person proves that they have unique blend of experience, expertise, and excellent health, the answer is certainly yes. And therefore, but saying yes had not come easy. NASA Administrator Dan Golden had agonized over the decision for a year and a half. I was really concerned because it was an incredibly bold proposal. And I was concerned, would we have a health problem? And there were all these issues, and I knew Tom Millard, and I called him and I said, my God, <laughs> can we really do it? How do I get him off this kick? One Sunday, I received a call from Mr. Dan Golden, and he said, uh, I need some help with that uh, friend of yours. He said, he's the most persistent guy I've ever known, and he's driving me out of my mind. He wants to go back in space again, and um, my heart says yes, but my mind says no. And that's when I told him, uh, he said, uh, you know, you're fighting an uphill battle because uh, He's going to be a pressure that I'm not sure I can help you with. 
Glenn wanted a justifiable reason for a second flight, and medical research has been his ticket. There are a lot of things happen to the younger astronauts up there when they're in space now. There are 50-some things that the NASA has charted so far, changes in the human body or the blood and so on, uh, that occur when you're up there in space. If I bring back good information in the limited areas that we're going to be looking into on this flight, in the muscle changes and sleep changes, things like that, then it's a start toward encouraging NASA and the scientists to look into these areas more. Many in the science community are skeptical of the validity of the research, yet at the same time supportive of Glenn taking a victory lap. John Glenn has talked an awful lot about the medical benefits of his mission, and I think it's difficult for the scientific community to place much credence in that. But I think it also says a lot about John Glenn's modesty and his greatness as an American, that he's not going to claim what's basically his. He's a hero, and he could fly on there simply by saying, hey, it's John Glenn, I want to go. It's particularly significant that you have John Glenn, America's first person to orbit the Earth, flying on basically what's going to be the last mission that we fly before we start building the International Space Station. So John Glenn's flights are really sort of the bookends on an era of American space exploration, because when John Glenn comes back from his second flight, we're going to start working on an International Space Station, which is going to be the effort of much of the human race rather than simply of the United States. The International Space Station is NASA's most ambitious project since landing astronauts on the moon. The station, a multinational venture for scientific research in space, comes with a price tag estimated between 20 and 25 billion dollars. John Glenn has been one of its most vocal advocates. Fortunately, we have continued to fund the space station. I think it's one of the greatest cooperative scientific enterprises in the history of this world. In fact, the greatest. The space station represents a major rethink for U.S. space policy. Instead of the Cold War competition of John Glenn's Mercury days, the space station requires international cooperation. America's one-time adversary is now being treated as an ally. Russian hardware, Russian rockets, and Russian cosmonauts are all required to put the space station in orbit. It's unbelievable the time we live in. We have Americans riding on Russian rockets. Russians riding on American rockets, American flags on Russian rockets. It's uh, up is down and down is up and left is right and right is left. Who knows? It is wonderful. The confusion is wonderful. But Russia's internal problems have delayed delivery of some key components. Just one indication of the complexity of managing such a huge international effort. The complexity of this project is enormous. It'll take 45 flights to build. We're talking about launches from four different sites around the world. Integrating these nations together has never been done. It's a, a huge systems management problem, and it's not going to be pretty. We'll have problems. I, I, I have no doubt about that. There'll be seven different vehicle types coming up to the space station, docking and exchanging goods and people. It'll be a million pounds in Earth orbit, bigger than a football field. You'll be able to see it flying overhead with the naked eye. NASA sees the space station as its next logical step. But a step to where? This is really a big engineering experiment 
to discover how you can build these large complex structures in space and also how do you organize an international team to do that because ultimately people want to go to Mars and they're assuming that Mars is such a large scale enterprise that that will also involve a lot of countries. So the space station is viewed by some people as sort of like, you know, a stepping stone for building the international relationships that you need in order to mount an even greater expedition. NASA is talking openly about going to Mars sometime in the first half of the 21st century. The brute technological force to get there, NASA planners believe, already exists. This NASA animation shows one Mars expedition now under study. The trip to Mars will take six months. And this will be no quick visit. These planetary explorers will live on Mars some 500 days. Of course, we've already been to Mars and to other planets in the solar system with remote control robots. The highly publicized Mars Pathfinder mission of 1997 was only the most recent probe to land on the Red Planet. Some of the next generation of planetary robots will be paving the way for human exploration of Mars. We're going to be measuring the radiation environment there, which of course is a potential hazard for uh, astronauts. We're going to be looking at the nature of the soil which is there to see if there are any contaminants which might be a serious problem for human exploration. And we're also taking along a small experiment to make oxygen out of the atmosphere, which is carbon dioxide, as a way to consider the possibility of actually making fuel in situ rather than having to carry it there. So there are a number of things which the robotic program can do to set the stage for eventual human exploration. But there is one concern that no machine can help answer. How will humans react to the psychological and physical stresses of a thousand day mission? A year will be spent aboard a cramped craft with little to see but the blackness of space. And then there are the debilitating effects of weightlessness. After only a few days in space, astronauts begin losing muscle tissue and calcium in their bones. The immune system deteriorates and the circulatory system weakens. It's as if space accelerates aging in the human body. These conditions call for exactly the kind of tests NASA plans to study on John Glenn's 77-year-old body. From a very practical standpoint, the Glenn flight is trying to find out what the effects of weightlessness are on older people so that you can have a better understanding generally of the effect of spaceflight on human beings. So there is a connection between what he's doing and the long-term vision that people have for the space program. Glenn knows what it means to be a guinea pig. Studying the effects of space on the human body was a large part of his Mercury flight. Once again, Glenn will be poked and prodded. Besides medical experiments, Glenn will also be assigned mundane chores like collecting blood and urine samples from other crew members. One indication that flying on the shuttle is not always as glamorous as it seems. Okay. 
and the shuttle is still a very dangerous way to travel it's risky throughout and so it takes very brave people to do it and the nation needs to bear that in mind because the nation needs to understand these risks so that when something does go wrong they know how to react I think that because the shuttle has been launched so safely so many times since Challenger that people are forgetting again just how risky it is there are few realistic options for escaping from a crippled shuttle this airliner evacuation slide assumes of course there has been a safe landing In the case of a mid-air abort, Glenn's training has included how to bail out of the shuttle. Such an escape is theoretically possible, but not likely. Okay. That's enough for one day. All right, then let's, let's get you out. Once out of the shuttle, Glenn's next concern would be parachuting safely into the ocean. and then staying afloat. Why would a 77-year-old put himself and his family through so much uncertainty? What rewards are worth so much risk? Is he trying to determine the last chapter of future biographies? Glenn refuses to speculate. But pry deep enough, and Glenn will share that his Mercury flight did not fully satisfy his need to know what the experience of space is like. I want to sop up every bit of experience I can on this. I'll have more time. I won't be limited to being just staying in the straps as I was the last time. I'll be able to float across and experience more of this weightlessness and uh, doing things in weightlessness, which is a new human experience in the last uh, 30 years or so. Being able to look out the window and watch things uh, go past on occasion, uh, it's going to be a great experience. So I'm really looking forward to it. I want to bring back some good information that can benefit an awful lot of folks sometime in the future. People have looked up for tens of thousands of years and wondered what was up there and what would they do if they could go up there. And here we are in our time, in our lifetime. We've lived through starting this whole thing. And now we are using it for the benefit of everybody right here. There are other reasons why Glenn is flying. If all goes well, this second flight could be a big boost for NASA's space program and for America itself. John Glenn deserves a second flight. America needs heroes. I don't know of a person I've talked to who hasn't felt good about this. started it. Why can't he go back? It's to prove whether the older people like us is going to be able to go if we so choose. It kind of shows the younger people that they can, they don't have to quit after there's a certain age. I think he's a hero, and I give his wife much credit for letting him go. He stirs people's spirits. He is intense, yet mild. He's tenacious, but calm. And he brings the spirit of the American people together. Why is this 77-year-old flying again? The real answer may be simply because John Glenn is John Glenn. And for most, that may be reason enough.
Three days before the scheduled launch, the STS-95 crew fly to Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida. This is the beginning of preparations for the final countdown. Glenn still flies prop planes at 77, but not jets. So on this flight, he takes a back seat to Commander Kurt Brown. But all eyes and cameras are focused on Glenn. NASA knew that Glenn's presence would generate public attention, but no one anticipated this reaction. At the last launch, less than 100 journalists were on hand. This time, nearly 4,000 members of the media have signed up. Not all of the reporting is positive. There is speculation about political paybacks. Others criticize the mission as a public relations stunt. Howdy, how you doing? How are you? I just get a hug. <laughs> Welcome back. Good to see you. The science experiments involving Glenn continue to be questioned especially after he is scrubbed from one of the principal sleep experiments. The concerns are not limited to the press. Glenn's wife and children initially had their own misgivings. John had announced one year before that he was going to retire as a senator. So I was looking forward to having him as my own, because I had given him to my, our government for 55 years, so I was ready. Dave and I have both grown up with Dad's um, choices of jobs, that he, in our whole lives, we've had death as kind of a, a something to deal with. So I think that's been there, and I kind of had the response of, I've been there, I don't, I don't want to do that anymore. I felt angry. I just didn't. I didn't want him to go. I didn't want any of us to go through worrying about about uh, what might happen if anything went wrong. What I was thinking about was just this replay of the Challenger. In my head, I must have watched that thing go up and blow up a hundred times. I don't know how many. I just watched it over and over and over. So that was my reaction. I just instantly saw that. I'm John Glenn. I'm PS2 on this flight and very glad to be here. And uh, one word on this whole thing. I, I have been pleasantly surprised at the outpouring of interest in this flight. And it's really gratifying to see people get so fired up about the space program again and about their interest in it. And this is gonna be a very research-rich flight. We've got about 83 different projects on this and we couldn't, I couldn't have, if I'd had my own pick of people, I don't think I could have picked better than the people I'm gonna be flying with. The commander of the mission is Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Kurt Brown. He has already spent over 40 days in space. Stephen Lindsay, also an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, is the pilot. This is his second mission. This is also the second flight for mission specialist Stephen Robinson who holds a PhD in engineering. <laughs> Mission specialist Scott Perezinski has flown two previous times. He is a medical doctor. Payload specialist Chiaki Mukai is also a medical doctor. She was the first Japanese woman to fly in space. This is her second flight. Mission Specialist Pedro Duque is the lone rookie on the flight. He will be the first native of Spain to fly in space. Just as crew compositions have changed, so have the rockets and spacecraft. John Glenn's Friendship 7 capsule would fit in a corner of the shuttle's payload bay. 
and the Atlas rocket Glenn rode atop is dwarfed by the shuttle's size and power. On Thursday morning, October 29th, 1998, all systems are go for launch. Worry over a hurricane in the Caribbean has vanished and the sky is completely clear. This is shuttle launch control. All continuing to go well in our launch countdown this morning for Discovery on mission STS-95. Countdown clock at T-minus two hours. This is to be Discovery's 25th flight into space. The power to propel Discovery into orbit comes from its massive engines. The main engines put out 400,000 pounds of thrust. But the real power resides with the two solid rocket boosters, which are strapped to the sides of the shuttle. Each rocket puts out over 3 million pounds of thrust. The massive shock waves generated at liftoff by these powerful rockets are enough to tear Discovery apart. To keep the shuttle intact, some 300,000 pounds of water are dropped into the cavity underneath the pad to absorb the shock waves. The shuttle, fully fueled, is a dangerous place to visit. Spectators are kept at least three and a half miles away from the launch pad. The safe distance NASA estimates is needed in the event of a near to ground explosion. All crew members now aboard the NASA Astro van that's been used for many years in taking astronauts out to the launch pads on the day of launch. We do expect quite a few visitors on center for today's launch of STS-95. By now, the shuttle pad has been cleared of all but a skeleton crew of workers. Taking your seat on the shuttle is not as easy as it might seem. Describing the tight squeeze is astronaut Richard Linehan. It's a bit different when you're in a launch configuration. You're obviously on, on your back with the orbiter's nose pointing straight up in the air. The uh, floor uh, becomes the wall, and the wall becomes the ceiling, and vice versa. And so you have to learn how to crawl in, and what handholds you can use, and where you can put your knees and feet and hands, so you're not touching switches or important things like that, but yet also be able to move around and position yourself to get up into the seat. Behind Commander Brown and Pilot Lindsay sit astronauts Duque and Perezinski. Despite being in the back seat, Perezinski is more than a passenger. This is a very demanding position. He, in some ways, needs to know uh, as much as both the pilot and commander and actually watches what they do and uh, kind of is a, is a reminder guide to them about uh, different procedures that will need to be accomplished. Glenn's assigned seat is down below on what's called the mid-deck. He'll ride there with Chiaki Mukai and Stephen Robinson. PS2 on board at this time. And uh, there's a senator using the handholds to get himself in. Just bounced right in there, and he's up in his seat. Looks like there's quite a bit more room down on the mid-deck. Yeah, there is. When they're laying on their backs, they're facing a bank of lockers. And there, there are no windows down there, so you really can't see anything. You're in a closed space down there. The nice thing about being on the flight deck is the fact that you've got uh, those windows that you can look out and see the sky, uh, things like that. You get a better idea of weather and what's happening on the outside world. As the final countdown approaches, the entire operation has gone off nearly without a hitch. John, add a ground two, uh, flight crew, how do you read? CDR, loud and clear. PLC, loud and clear. MS-1, loud and clear. MS-2, loud and clear. MS-3, loud and clear. PS-1, loud and clear. PS-2, loud and clear. As in 1962, people have flocked to the Cape to witness the liftoff. Much of the rest of the world is watching on television. 
Back in Ohio, in Glenn's hometown of New Concord, hundreds of people have packed into the John Glenn High School Auditorium to watch the launch on giant screens. Five minutes before liftoff comes an unexpected hold. A private plane has strayed into restricted airspace around the Cape. We can hold it to the T-minus five minute mark while the superintendent of range operations attempts to help clear the airspace of the aircraft in the area. There is a 10 minute delay before the countdown resumes. The orbiter flight control systems are being moved through their pre-programmed pattern and they will be verified they are ready for launch. You'll see a go for launch. The three main engines are being gimbaled and positioned for launch. All systems are go for launch at this time, just a few minutes away from the 25th voyage of Discovery with a crew of seven. All systems have been reported go for launch of Discovery, less than one minute away now from the historic return of John Glenn to space. I copy and accept all stations. The countdown clock will continue. 20 seconds. T minus 15. T minus 10, 9, 8. We have a go for engine start. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. These first two minutes after liftoff, when the solid rockets are firing, is the most dangerous part of the launch. A camera attached to the side of one of the solid rockets captures the separation. Nine minutes after launch, Discovery is traveling at 17,500 miles an hour. After 36 years, Glenn is back in orbit. Discovery is 347 miles above the Earth, twice the altitude of Glenn's Mercury flight. Glenn wastes no time commenting on the view. Hello, Houston, this is PS2. I mean, let me get sprung out of the mid-deck for a little while. We're just going by Hawaii, and that is absolutely gorgeous. Do a trite old statement, zero G, and I feel fine. Hey, Roger that. We had a bunch of your friends asking about you today, and they were wondering how you're feeling, and I'm sure they're here, glad to hear that. And, Beamer, let the record show that uh, that John has a smile on his face, and it goes from one ear to the other one, and we haven't been able to remove it yet.
While Glenn celebrates his return to orbit, on the ground there is a worry. A review of videotapes shows that a piece of the shuttle had fallen off during the launch. Uh, just prior to liftoff, after main engine start, what appears to be a panel in the vicinity of the drag chute door came off the vehicle and came in contact with the center main engine bell. We are evaluating at this time. We do not expect this to impact your, your mission. The 11 pound aluminum panel covers the shuttle's drag parachute, which is used to slow the shuttle during landing. The panel had fallen harmlessly onto the pad. NASA had been lucky. Had the metal panel punctured a part of the main engine's nozzle, there could have been a catastrophic explosion right on the launch pad. But what everyone wants to know is how John Glenn is adjusting the space. There's been a track record in the past of a high percentage of the people getting sick. But fortunately, the crew has felt fine up here this time. We've been doing real well. Uh, I had my own concerns about that because when I went up before, it was uh, I was strapped to the spacecraft, and so I didn't really get this free-floating feeling uh, like you have here. Despite the attention given to Glenn, the real work of the crew is carrying out 83 scientific experiments. One of the most important is a 3,000-pound satellite called Spartan. Discovery Houston, we've pulled the room and you are go for deploy. Using the shuttle's robotic arm, Spartan is released to fly free in orbit for two days before being retrieved. During that time, Spartan's instruments will measure the sun's corona and solar wind. Now we're separating at about one foot per second. You can see the satellite uh, drifting away. Very controlled maneuver. This satellite is called PANSAT. It was built by postgraduate naval students, a kind of on-the-job training in how to build a communications satellite. How do liquids behave in space? The answer could help manufacturing on Earth. This experiment is designed to collect data on surface tension. And then, of course, there are the studies about the effects of space on Glenn. Yesterday, everyone was puffed face around here, looked like uh, the poppin' fresh doughboy or or something like that, and I think my face is still swelled up some. This is just one of many press conferences jammed into the flight, bringing a whole new meaning to the phrase high visibility. Well, Mr. Cronkite, uh, John's doing a fantastic job, and... Uh, the questions come from nearly everyone and everywhere. High school students raised on space movies, get a chance to compare science fiction with science fact. Commander Brown, when blasting off, do you actually feel the inertia in the space shuttle? Do you feel like we often see on TV when the faces become distorted? Well, first of all, we, uh, we astronauts, we, like, we don't really refer to it as blasting off because that sounds pretty uncontrollable. Uh, during the launch, we call it launching, but during the launch, uh, you don't really have the uh, distortion on your faces. Uh, that's uh, more for the movies, I think. Uh, but we do feel the acceleration of the orbiter. It uh, is a very uh, amazing vehicle. We uh, jump off the launch pad and accelerate right up to two and a half Gs, which means you would weigh two and a half times of what you would weigh here on Earth. And so we, we do feel the Gs or the acceleration, but uh, it doesn't really distort our face or anything. There are space chats with comic Jay Leno. Hey, Jay, we have you loud and clear from Discovery. How do you hear us? Veteran newsman Walter Cronkite. And Glenn's fellow Mercury astronaut, Scott much. Carpenter. Scott, I think in our next, next to the job, we ought to come up here and have a retirement home in space. Because, you know, you spill food, it doesn't go on your necktie. It just floats out away from you. And, in fact, I got some oatmeal on my glasses the other day. And uh, you don't need a walker up here. You don't need to worry about osteoporosis or canes or anything like that because you just float across the room. There's no such thing as broken hips or anything like that. And uh, so, it, and if, you know, if you 
have trouble sleeping at night, why well, it's uh, no problem because you have another night coming up in not more than 45 minutes. So maybe this is a place we can start a retirement home someday. Even NASA's administrator, Dan Golden, takes a turn at the mic. Well, before I ask you a few questions, I have a few messages. First from Annie, you ain't going up again. <laughs> Secondly, you caused trouble with my mother. Last night, my 86-year-old mother called me up, and she wanted to know when she was going into space. And if you think you're tenacious, I don't know how I'm going to tell her no. There are media moments made out of every opportunity. This is Mission Control Houston, and from on board Discovery during her off-duty time, a very energetic Chiaki Mukai has uh, just begun her exercise period, a bit ahead of schedule. She's uh, joined by pilot Steve Lindsay, demonstrating physics in microgravity as a fluid drop can be floated and actually eaten off of a spoon. Halloween falls on the third day of the mission, and the entire crew celebrates, masquerading as John Glenn. NASA's message, hammered over and over, is that space is fun. But there is also time for deeper reflection. I don't see how anyone could look out from a spacecraft like this and see uh, the, the part of creation that we can observe from here some uh, 350 miles up and look at the Earth down there and go by it and go around it like this and not be impressed with creation. I think we have so many religious beliefs on Earth that all believe in a higher being, and yet we somehow confuse what the uh, our beliefs in God and, and we make war on each other over, over religious beliefs and so on. If you could just look down from up here and, and see what a beautiful Earth we live on, perhaps everyone would be a little more peacefully inclined than we've been in the past. Morning, Discovery. On Saturday, November 7th, after nine days in space, Discovery prepares for the return to Earth. Excess water is dumped overboard to reduce the shuttle's weight. And the 44 jets used to fly Discovery are tested. One of them is found to be leaking, but mission controllers believe the problem should not affect re-entry. The larger concern is the missing panel for the drag chute and what it might mean. We think if it comes out above Mach 3, it'll burn off. If it comes out below Mach 3, we think it'll tear off. Uh, we also think that you'll be able to see it out the overhead window if it does come out uh, with some mirrors. And again, remember that we think none of this will happen and you'll have a normal entry. Discovery begins its return to Earth. NASA describes the shuttle as an unpowered hypersonic glider, which is one way of saying that the 100-ton shuttle drops out of the sky almost as fast as a brick. First, over the Pacific, then, the southern part of the United States, across the Gulf of Mexico, and on into Florida, all at supersonic speeds. Discovery speed still continuing to drop. Time to landing now, just 10 minutes, 50 seconds. Discovery Houston, energy, ground track, and nav are go for runway 33, touchdown at 2,600 feet at 205 knots. The 15,000-foot runway awaits. It is longer and wider than most commercial aviation strips, but not by much. And because the shuttle is an unpowered glider, there are no second chances at landing. If the pilot misses the runway, 
the shuttle would most likely plow into the surrounding swamp. Three minutes, 10 seconds away from touchdown. Discovery now 68 miles away from the landing facility, traveling at the speed of 600 miles per hour. Commander Kurt Brown at the controls as Discovery continues to track toward a landing. Houston, on at the 180, you're a go for emergency drag chute deploy only. Copy. Word now from the crews on the ground that uh, they've had a chance to look at the aft near the uh, parachute access door. And uh, it appears that the chute pack is uh, intact. As Discovery nears final approach, it announces its presence with two sonic booms. By now, the commander has taken control from the onboard computers as the shuttle approaches runway 33. Discovery now at an altitude of just three miles away from the Kennedy Space Center at distance of about 10 miles. Time to touch down one minute, 45 seconds. And Houston, we have the runway in sight. Roger, runway in sight. As Kurt Brown is now piloting the, the shuttle down the glide slope and uh, in center line of the runway, Steve Lindsay, the pilot, is, is focused primarily on the, the landing gear extend switches, where he will arm them at uh, 2,000 feet and lower the landing gear at 300 feet. Touchdown. 134 orbits and three and a half million miles later, mission STS-95 comes to an end. Welcome to Discovery from a mission dedicated to improving life on Earth. Beautiful landing, Kurt. Stand by for post-landing deltas. The question now on everyone's mind is what will be the effects of nine days of weightlessness on Glenn's body? Even younger astronauts can faint when they first stand up after an extended period in space. There had been speculation that Glenn would have to be carried off on a stretcher. He is wobbly and unsure, but he walks under his own power, joining in the traditional ground inspection of the shuttle. I wanted to get out with the rest of the crew and do the walk around. I think my determination would have been if I'd have been on my hands and knees, I was going to do it. <laughs> Obviously, I was not at my doing my best gait out there yesterday. And uh, when you got out, I was, I was, uh, you know, the. Disor not disoriented, that'd be a too strong a word for it, but you're walking very spraddle-legged like this so you can keep your balance because if you get too far one way, you just can't catch yourself fast enough. The, the, the pressure on me was just to be there as a crew member more than it was what any other outside perception might be. What did it mean, this 77-year-old man flying again in the heavens? Was it just nostalgia for the past? A calculated press relations stunt? Or the next step in the exploration of space? What is certain is that in 1998, just as in 1962, America was in need of a hero. And John Glenn was there. To learn more about John Glenn, American Hero, 
visit us at PBS online at the internet address on your screen. Annie and I attended a dinner back home in Ohio not too long ago in, in which the person introducing me got all carried away with accolades and accomplishments I never dreamed of having in this life or the next and finished this introduction by finally saying, there are few truly great men in this world. And then he introduced me. Now that's rather heady. And going home that night, I guess I was still thinking about it and mentally basking in the glow of that introduction. And I said, uh, Annie, you know, if you think about it, there aren't very many really, truly great Americans in this world. And it took her about 10 seconds to say, let me tell you something, there's sure one less than you think there is. <laughs> Funding for John Glenn American Hero was provided by the annual financial support of PBS viewers like you. Major funding has been provided by the following corporation. I got to see a man walk on the moon. My kids deserve to see something as inspiring. NASA and its worldwide partners will soon launch the first stages of the International Space Station. This is PBS.